It's a new time for us. Five o'clock in London, midday in New York, 1 a.m. in Hong Kong, 4 a.m. in Sydney, Australia, 9 a.m. in San Francisco, and 11.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. My name is Patrick L. Young, the IPO Vid Livestream Series 21, Episode 5. That makes it a very nice round number. 125 starts here. First of all, let me say a huge thank you to the Kazakhstan Stock Exchange CEO, Alina Aldenbergian, for her exemplary leadership in spearheading the International Exchange Forum, the role of exchanges in the transformation of financial markets last week in Almaty. The number one financial conference, it was over two days. First day was hosted by the Central Bank. We were talking about the digital tenge on the 30th anniversary of the paper tenge currency in the Caucasian state. It was an absolutely magnificent way to monitor Mark Case's 30th anniversary. And thank you to all the team who helped make my last keynote speech of 2023 so special, along with a fabulous panel session that I had the honor to chair. Happy birthday to Case. Now, while I was there, I was talking about, well, all manner of things about the future of finance and markets and so on. One of the questions that people always ask me is why do markets matter? And here's the reason, ladies and gentlemen, one simple anecdote. It's really good because even kids and millennials ought to see the point to it. And that is, well, indeed, it's gonna come up on a beautiful slide in just a couple of seconds, all about why markets matter. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is related to the North Korean economy. When we talk about the North Korean economy, and I do believe there is a slide coming soon, please, um, <clears throat> to, the, uh, to the screen. Excellent. Why do markets matter? Blackpink. Now, for those of you who are really interested in K-pop, you will, of course, be obsessed with the fact that the seven-year contract renewal is on at the moment. The shares of their management company, their label, actually managed to fall 13% in a day on the Korean Stock Exchange just recently over whether or not these four lovely young ladies would be re-signing for a new seven-year term. But why does that matter? Well, if we go to the next slide we, can slide, we can see it very easily. The total size of the economy of the democratic People's Republic of Korea is going to be about $21 billion by the course of the end of this year. The total value, ladies and gentlemen, of South Korea's most famous musical export in the popular musical genre, K-pop, is worth $8 to $9 billion per annum. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, a group of boy bands and girl bands are worth roughly 40% of the value of the entire North Korean economy. Markets matter, ladies and gentlemen, that's why. Let's go back to the Exchange Paris for a couple of little notes. The Australian Stock Exchange, they have finally announced their technology solution, technology in rather more retrogressive fashion. Once upon a time, of course, it was all going to be about digital asset, the blockchain, all of these sorts of exciting things. $250 million umpteen years later, and they got nowhere. Where did we end up there for, ladies and gentlemen? Well, they're going to be using Tata Consulting Services, the people who are still installing the TMX system in Canada six years later, and I think twice the overall agreed budget as it was originally, and indeed just recently delivered an incredibly late systems upgrade to the multi-commodity exchange of India. Hmm. On the same regressive note, so sadly... A very murky chapter in the interest rate business is closing as the limited regulatory cast have sought to throttle risk transfer from risk-based products. It's a foolish move, and therefore we say farewell Busby, which was, of course, itself a copy of the New York Bank Index futures that were originally on the Intercont Intercontinental Exchange. It's a rather foolish move, and it's hardly surprising given the gross limitations of many central banks for the past decade or two who retain their Canutian faith in their ability to control interest rates. But nonetheless, this, ladies and gentlemen, is a dark age for financial futures products because what we're seeing is just at the point in time when credit risk is so vital in the cycle, large corporates around the world are going to be forbidden a way to actually manage that credit risk in the open public markets. Our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is Johan Norberg. The topic, the capitalist manifesto. The multi-award winning Johan Norberg is an author and documentary filmmaker born in Sweden. He received his MA in the history of ideas from the University of Stockholm and is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. Norberg has written books on a broad range of topics, including global economics and popular science. He's achieved a worldwide readership with books like Progress, Open, and most recently, The Capital Man Capitalist Manifesto, Trans 
translated into more than 30 languages. Johan also regularly hosts documentaries on development and economics for American public television, including India Awakes, The Real Adam Smith, and Sweden Lessons for America. Johan, welcome to IPO Vid. It's an absolute joy to have you today. Where in the world are you today? Thank you, Patrick. I'm happy to join you from my own country, Sweden, today, but uh, not Stockholm, where I usually live, but in Malmö, southern Sweden. So if I had continued for another half hour or so, I would have been in Denmark. What a lovely place. What a lovely place to be all together as we approach into the winter months. I suppose your only foible at the moment is that the days are getting a little bit shorter. Yeah, so we have to step up with our productivity because there are few hours in which we can be safely and sanely awake. Yes, that's always the tricky part. And in the summer, you get almost no sleep whatsoever because it's daylight all the time. However, that's only one foible to Sweden. Tell me, Johan, how did you get into this fascination with markets, with capitalism and indeed with trade as a whole? Well, actually, it started uh, with me not believing in these ideas. And and when I suddenly learned that I had missed on, out on something tremendously important in human history, it became a devotion. So basically, I grew up a teenager believing that uh, modern civilization is kind of overrated and that we must have lived in an ancient path when we lived in harmony with one another and and with nature and that compared to to that the stress of today big business and factories and and stuff and pollution couldn't be couldn't be good um but then i started reading history and uh, specifically i started to read up on my ancestors history in northern sweden and soon i realized that they didn't live ecologically they died ecologically at a very young age uh, they lived in desperate poverty and when when the weather was bad which it often was in in northern sweden there was a crop failure and people starved so um, their lives were saved by free markets free trade modern industry and that turned into a uh, a mission to me to explain to others who hadn't seen what I hadn't seen back then, and to tell them that this is what we need to create opportunities around the world today as well. That's really fascinating. So you went down an academic route and you were studying in some of the prestigious institutes of Sweden and so on. How did you get your foothold, therefore, as you were going forward with this into the world of TV and writing books? Well, I hang around at the University of (laughs) Stockholm and... um, the audience is going to have uh, they're going to have to decide how prestigious that is <laughs> but meanwhile um while i was doing that i was constantly trying to write and talk on the side uh, actually and uh, writing articles and being constantly rejected by newspapers and magazine which was great because that helped me to come up with better ideas and better pieces and try to adapt to what they were interested in and um Sometime around the um, uh, turn of the millennium, I began to be published in Sweden and I uh, was uh, I got an offer to write a book on one of my topics, Wilhelm Moberg, the great Swedish novelist who uh, wrote about the Swedes in the 19th century who emigrated to America to find a li- land of, of freedom. And that was quite a, a bestseller and that gave me an opportunity to write more books. And then in 2001, I... Um, struck gold in the literary business by writing on globalization and free trade, a book called In Defense of Global Capitalism. And it turned out that this was a debate that was going on everywhere because this was these were the days of the anti-globalization movement, the protesters at every WTO meeting, IMF World Bank meeting. And I was, uh, to some, it seemed like I was one of the few who argued against them, saying that, look, we need more capitalism, not less. And that was then translated into lots of places around the world. And that started an international career. Fabulous. So, I mean, I'm quite curious, therefore. I mean, where, where do you think we are at the moment in terms of global capitalism and how it's working? 
Well, we're back to where we were when I wrote that book. And that's why I just wrote this recent uh, new defense of global markets called the Capitalist Manifesto, because now suddenly free markets are under attack again. It seems like um, not just protesters and the traditional left, but also many on the populist right and the national conservatives in the US uh, are suddenly hostile to free trade and uh, argue in favor of active industrial policy and so on, and technocrats, uh, the mainstream. We have governments in, in the US, in the e European Union, in India and China, everywhere saying that they have to repatriate uh, industry production. Again, they uh, want to um, pick winners, subsidize particular industries and uh, not let, let leave those decisions to, to market forces. So we're in a bad place when it comes to the opinion but not when it comes to capitalism, because it's actually thriving. I can yes. see why people are so miserable and think that the world is going to the dogs, because we've had a rough 20 years. We've had, you know, the great financial crash, uh, the um, pandemic, we've endless wars and chaos in the Middle East, Putin's invasion of, of Ukraine. And yet those 20 years have been the best 20 years in human history. When you look at objective indicators of living standards, 130,000 people were lifted out of extreme poverty every day over 20 years. And it happened in places that began to integrate into global markets. And that's why uh, someone has to defend them. Well, that, that's I mean, it's, it's a great point because I don't know about your childhood, but my childhood was certainly spent a, a great deal of the time with, um, you know, the, the, the situation where endlessly the children's television programs were always offering these appeals where we were trying and I mean don't get me wrong there was a horrible but you had everything from you know this the classic 60s war by Afra all the way through the 1970s into the 1980s and you look at the incredible waves of terrible poverty there was at that point in time and yet nowadays the number of people I mean it's so funny everybody said we've got to get everybody on to one dollar a day and then everything will be hunky-dory and actually it seems to me ever since they managed to more or less remove world poverty certainly i mean it's no longer the case where 20 30 percent of the world are living in extreme poverty ever since everybody's gone well the world's terrible it's really awful it's a terrible place to live in and yet as you say i mean that's an incredible number One hundred and thirty thousand people a day being lifted out of poverty is mind-boggling yeah it is but we're not happy <laughs> we're, no. all, we're, all, we're all miserable. And, and I would guess that's partly human nature. I mean, when problems solved, are problems uh, forgotten, and then we just move on to the next problem. Um, and that's why we need to study history and we need to talk to our uh, parents and grandparents if they're still alive and to find out what they were going through. Because uh, in so many ways uh, where we've had freedom, uh, entrepreneurs, we scientists have innovated ourselves out of problems again and again. Uh, but it's also the case that people, the anti-capitalists keep on moving the goalposts. So yes. I mean, once upon a time, they say that, look, here in the Western world, that's what Mark, Karl Marx said in that other manifesto, the communist one, <laughs> um, said that, look, if we have capitalism, yes, a few people will get super rich, but the pro uh, proletarians will starve and the middle classes will be become proletarians. But eventually we all now, actually, the average person in, in Western democratic societies live like the kings did when Colomar, well, better than kings, because we also have, have smartphones and a wider selection of, of food and transportation opportunities. Um, but then they said, yes, but that's because we exploit the, the poor in the rest of the world because it's always a zero-sum game. That's what people think. But then obviously as countries, first East Asia, but now more countries around the world are beginning to liberalize their markets, they grow faster than we did back then and reduce poverty faster than we did during the industrial revolution. So now they're saying, yeah, yeah, okay, we're solving the those problems, but what about the environment? If more people are not, if people are not starving, and if they're not desperately poor, then they'll be able to travel and produce and consume, and that will be bad for the planet. So then we had to deal with these problems, which, by the way, is something that only innovative and market-based societies can do, I think.
Well, yes, it's very interesting. I mean, as you say, this this whole thing, and of course, I mean, we've well, we've had more or less in our entire lifetime this endless attack on growth. I mean, starting with the, the, the Club of Rome and the limits to growth. I mean, gosh, there's the most hilarious piece of work of the 1970s. Monty Python looks almost serious by comparison when you read this utter nonsense, which was a beyond Malthusian delusion. And you're right. I mean, it's all about the pie. Nobody seems to think the pie can grow in these in these groups. And yet when you look at it, the pie has grown exponentially in the course of the last 30 years alone. Yeah. And th- th- that's another in- interesting data point. Again, we've had 20, 25 <clears throat> rough years. And yet if we try to measure our average living standards by GDP per capita, some almost a third of the wealth that the average person has ever attained ever in human history was produced during these 20, 25 years. That's yeah. pretty amazing. And that tells you that it's not a zero sum game. We keep on, if we come up with better solutions, better ways of doing something better, faster or cheaper tomorrow than we do today, then we're all better off. And on a free market, no deal ever happens unless both parties think that they walk away from it in better shape than they walked into it. And that's positive some, all of it, but somehow it seems like our brains aren't tuned to it. It seems like we we have a hard time understanding it. It's, it's quite counterintuitive. And to me, I, I have to find the explanation in human humanity's prehistory because it's so recent. This it, we we should we are so lucky that we get to live in these two centuries, basically, when we've had an explosion of growth, of innovation, of poverty reduction. We've gone from all around 80% of the world population in extreme poverty back 200 years ago to 8% today. We should be lucky and count our blessings just being able to live in this, uh, and not to mention life expectancy, which was 30 back then and over <coughs> 70 around the world right now. However, since it's so recent and since it's only happened just recently, it means that That's where all the goods and services and technologies we've got come from. But it's not where our brains come from. It's not where our instincts come from and many of our belief systems. They come from a previous era when life was harsh, brutish, and short. And if since we didn't have growth and innovation, if someone was richer than you, he probably stole it from you. So it makes made sense back then to develop this idea that the world is a zero-sum game. And now we're just going to have to count to 10 and uh, and study economics and history to understand that that's not the world we're living in anymore. So really fascinating, super energetic intro. It's it's magnificent altogether, Johan. Tell us a bit about your most recent book and your arguments for capitalism in the Capitalist Manifesto. Yeah, my starting point is that uh, everybody read the past few decades wrong. Not everybody, probably not you, Patrick, but most people I talk to, and, and, and especially politicians, they read it wrong. They think that we've just learned because of the pandemic, because of war, that it's dangerous with international supply chains, free trade is not reliable, um, free markets don't produce the goods. I think we just learned the, quite the opposite. And the I, I think the pandemic is a great case in point. At the start of it, lots of us, at least I, did, I I should confess, I started to sort of think that I should have been a prepper, I should have bought more canned food and have stocks of toilet paper, because if the world is shutting down, if there are lockdowns everywhere, probably this whole thing is going to collapse. But it took days, and then suddenly all the shelves were stocked again. And why was that? That was not because Governments knew how to produce um, food in a great way when most workers couldn't go to work, when important intermediate goods and resources were suddenly not available, when markets were blocked. It only happened because the experts, people on the ground, on the factory floors, entrepreneurs and farmers, they looked at what they had at hand and started to improvise and adapt to their local knowledge with their individual creativity and started to rebuild supply chains in real time. It was the harshest, most difficult test you could uh, you could go through uh, for, for global markets 
and they triumphed. Yeah. All these devastating shortages that we thought were going to appear, they were out of the way in a manner of days. And, you know, when if, if we would have discussed this 10 years ago and said we will have a pandemic, the biggest since the Spanish flu, half of the world's population will be under house arrest, and then Putin will invade Ukraine. I think we would all have expected that we would now be in a post-apocalyptic movie. We would all be look, walking around like Mad Max or in The Last of Us or, or something like that. But despite the horrors, despite all the destruction that authoritarians and despots um, keep on, on piling upon us, life is pretty good. Yeah, which and, and poverty keeps being reduced. So that tells you something about the power of capitalism. Yes, it's incredible. I mean, you look at what went on in previous generations, people would have starved to death. You look at during the Second World War, where even neutral countries, people ate some pretty unedifying substances in order to manage to keep body and soul together. Whereas this time around, I mean, people didn't even lack avocado toast in East London for long enough to get rickets. I mean, nothing happened whatsoever. And and indeed, when when that um, <clears throat> captain intrepidly handbrake turned that ship, was it the Ever Given in the Suez Canal? I'm not quite sure what he was doing. What a maneuver from the Fast and the Furious, I think. It, it was incredible because, yes, people would, oh my goodness, it's a crisis and nothing's happened. But you look at what went on. Well, yes, Amazon Prime did manage to have a few days where people didn't get their stuff within 24 or 48 hours. That's that's hashtag first world problems, isn't it? Writ large. It's quite incredible. I mean, the strength of our economy is, is, is absolutely amazing. We're going to come back to that in just a second. Let me say hello to Peter Secon. Nowadays, of course, also the Investor Relations Director of Valerian PLC. Thank you, Peter, for joining us. Great to see you today. I'm glad you weren't caught out by the earlier start time. Um, I hope you are on the couch with Ari, enjoying a, uh, a lovely, pleasant cleansing ear, ale and uh, able to watch what's going on. And I believe we've also got a comment from Jonathan. Jonathan Cowan has uh, just turned up. And meanwhile, I can see I've got something from Ian Miller just turned in. Interesting conversation. Many thanks both. Thank you very much, Ian. It's a pleasure to see you joining the show once again. If we have that comment from um, Jonathan Cowan, please show it on the screen because I do not have it in my feed. Curiously enough, you can ping it onto the screen right now. If not, don't worry about that. You can pass it on to me in a minute. So, when we look at what's going on, I mean, you've written this capitalist manifesto, you've tried to explain essentially that markets work, that ultimately the tide rises all boats and all of those other cliches, growing the pie, et cetera, et cetera. What, what do you think are the really key things people have to pay attention to at the moment in terms of threats to capitalism? Well, you know, um, the... Um... The great um, Henry David Thoreau, the poet and transcendentalist philosopher, the guy who lived at Walden, wrote some 150 years ago, the trade and commerce seems to be made of rubber because they constantly bounce on top of all the regulations and obstacles put in their way by the decision makers. And that's what solves us again and again. But there's a limit to how much they can do that. If we, if the obstacles are too difficult, too many. I mean, trade and commerce aren't made of rubber, so they won't be able to bounce over everything. And that's one thing, this creeping incremental regulation that comes in every area constantly because of any kinds of, of concerns for, for safety or for precaution or what have you, puts a limit to Innovation uh, as such, Italy just banned lab-grown meat because they thought that was a danger to, to their uh, beef farmers. Um, but also in those tiny adaptations and improvisations that have to be done constantly by businesses to, to deal with disruptions and changes. Uh, whenever there are, every regulation creates more difficulties and higher costs in trying yeah. to improvise and adapt. So that's something we really have to look at with a suspicious mind. Yes, the other thing, I mean, strikes me out of all of that is also the inability of government. They can, they're very good at adding new regulations. They're very poor at finding a way to comply easily. And, and certainly the one that drives me insane is having just spent a couple of days in an obscure part of the world looking for a FedEx courier who could get a document to Hong Kong, 
for no good reason. I mean, an electronically signed or even a signed, printed and scanned version would have done exactly the same thing because that's all the government are going to do for it. But yet, at the same time, you have to send this incredible amount of paperwork around the world, which makes no sense in many, many, many respects. It's, it's quite fascinating. Thank you very much. I've just got the comment through. Uh, we have a slight pause on our LinkedIn feed at the moment. But Jonathan Cowan, great to see you, Jonathan. Um, I have done a lot of work in Sweden and the Nordic region. I love these guys. They're the very near to us and once more true Celts no well now there's an interesting accusation to be made against you I, I'm not sure I'm not sure that's a fair one to be part of the uh, one of the world's most pugnacious races the people who started just outside Belgrade and fought their way all the way to Ireland and told basically they had nobody else to fight um, thank you Jonathan great comment but I think it is interesting actually when we look at this because you know my childhood was defined as Scandinavia was full of these incredible existential socialists who were trying to kill everything. And then suddenly we come through the course of the last five years and Sweden's reigned supreme. I mean, it was the country that definitively led the world in keeping the economy open rather than closing it down and policing the streets. You're doing incredibly well as an economy per se. And I think actually one of the things people don't follow is the fact that the economy is actually remarkably open for business. Yes, it is. And uh, one reason why it is, this is the explanation for this paradox, I think, is that we got a uh, got vaccinated uh, inoculation. We tried socialism in the 1970s and 80s, and that has helped us to resist it later on. Um, because we, we did do that, especially Sweden was ahead of the pack in the in, for two decades, uh, Sweden actually doubled the size of government, of total government spending, and um, increased taxes and uh, regulated everything and uh, introduced price controls and what have you. And actually, Swedes thought and Swedish politicians thought that they could do this because we were already one of the richest countries on the planet, based on 100 years of a very open economy, yeah. very limited government. We got these big multinational companies and a very competitive private sector. That made us almost richest on the planet. But then politicians made that mistake in the 70s, thinking, OK, why bother? We can do anything. We can't fail. <laughs> so let's just start spending money and redistribute big time. And that's what they did for 20, 25 years. And this is what everybody still remembers about Sweden. That that's what they always ask me about around the world. Are you are you still socialists? But uh, this was really a um, a horrible era mm. in so many ways. For more than thirty years, we didn't create a single net job in the private sector. Not a single net job. Uh, and many of our most important businesses, you know, IKEA left mm -hmm. Sweden. Tetra Pak uh, moved away from Sweden, yeah. many of our greatest entrepreneurs. So we became more equal by chasing away all the rich people. Uh, and, and that was the one era in modern Swedish economic history when we actually lagged behind other uh, rich countries. And it all ended in a complete mess in the early 1990s in a financial crash. For a brief moment in time, we even had, had to introduce the central bank had to introduce a 500% interest rate. So nowadays we think that 5% is pretty, <laughs> quite a lot. <laughs> pretty nifty. That was, that was 500% because nobody wanted the Swedish Corona. Nobody wanted to lend us any money. And at that point in time, uh, even the social Democrats said that enough is enough. Let's go back to the model we had before of a more open economy, smaller government, reducing taxes and, and reforming social security and many of those things. And so I, I think that nowadays, when you look around Europe, um, Sweden is, when it comes to the welfare state and social spending, quite a normal Western European country. And when it comes to markets, it's a more open and a more capitalist economy than, than the average European economy. Yes, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, as you mentioned, Tetra Pak, the people who did essentially the ultimate containerization, but for the consumer, uh, they had quite an incredible business. And they were, I think, Knightsbridge gain at, uh, at the loss of Sweden's in terms of having bought quite a large amount of SW1 subsequently to house their families. 
it is fascinating how these things turn around. And it's certainly very interesting. You consider the fact that <clears throat> in the early 1990s, as you say, that came that crisis. I mean, even the OM, the Swedish uh, Stock Exchange, was actually looking. They opened an office in London because, they, because the government introduced withholding tax on bonds. And therefore, they gave a great piece of arbitrage as to how financial market infrastructure could go, which is just a little bit of a nerd out for our home readers in the world of exchanges. What do you think of the world right now? Because there are lots of countries that have gone through incredible cycles. I mean, the UK, for example, is in this, I think, horrible nadir at the moment. They've all forgotten what Mrs. Thatcher did to rescue the country from a fast track to the third world during the course of the 1980s. You've had a, quite an incredible turnaround in, say, New Zealand, where it was actually the socialists who did a great deal of work to really make that a powerhouse economy. Are there any nations that you see particularly at risk? And are there any nations that you see in a particularly exciting phase of deregulation, growth and capitalism? Yeah, that's a good question, because in a way, I think we're all at risk of making that Swedish mistake of the 1970s, thinking that, you know, taking wealth for granted, because it's it's fairly comfortable. And then he that has satisfied his thirst turns his back to the well, and you forget about uh, how difficult it is to create successful business models and create growth and create innovation, and that it takes open and free markets. So lots of economies are making these mistakes, and they've tried to deal with problems of less growth and um, disappointing um, productivity by borrowing heavily. And this is one thing I would uh, keep an eye on in the future. You know, the, the average of uh, OECD public debt right now, it's getting to the 100% mark. Yep. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, we would have said that this is a disaster waiting to happen when we saw this in Greece and we, when we saw this in Italy. Now we're all there, basically. Yeah. And that's a very scary thing. Because as Sweden found out, there is a, you can defy gravity for a while, uh, but not forever. And there's a point at which when people begin to hesitate, there's a rapid change of, of equilibrium. So things can go wrong. And there is this worrying sense I get sometimes that we aren't able to really reform our economies unless we end up in a major crisis. Uh, yeah. One interesting country to look at in the, the uh, months and years ahead, I think, is Argentina, a, mm -hmm. sort of a, the chronic disaster of Latin America. They used to be richer than Sweden. They used to, 100 years ago, they used to be richer than France and Germany. Um, we had this saying, rich as an Argentinian. Um, but yes. then they thought that, look, we're top of the world. We don't have to care about things. Let's just redistribute and spend, waste money and destroy businesses and export opportunities. And that they got 100 years of stagnation. Uh, nine times they, the government uh, was, was going bankrupt. Uh, it's government defaults um, nine times. And uh, recently increasing poverty from 10% to 40% uh, in Argentina which used to be one of the richest countries on the planet. Yet, just the other day, they elected this libertarian, Javier Millet. Uh, I don't know if he has the, the temper and the, the wisdom to come up with the right set of reforms, but it definitely shows you that he got a mandate for change, big time, yes. because yes. people saw that the alternative was to, to look for food in the, uh, in the trash cans. Um, so um, here's to hoping that, that it will work out, but it's a sad thing that it has to go that far. It's an ugly mess altogether. And actually, I, I deliberately put on today my, my US dollar tie uh, in honor of Mr. Millet. I don't know whether he'll succeed either. But as we know, one of the things he's talking about is getting rid of the Argentine peso and dollarizing the economy once again. I'm not sure whether that will work out for him. And you're right. I mean, it's going to be very difficult because he comes from a relative minority party pro rata. So therefore, he's going to have a great deal of political power against him. And the Peronista uh, establishment has been against him for 80 something years. But certainly as a way to completely stuff up an incredible, dynamic and amazing country, there, there are a few better examples than Argentina. It really, really has been a tragedy of the, of the course of our lifetimes and well beyond it. So. I mean, when we're looking at this, this state of play at the moment, is there any criteria? Is there any, are there any key elements 
to capitalism, to the capitalist manifesto that a country needs to adhere to in order to enjoy the benefits of the system? I think there is, um, mm-hmm. but I don't think um, it really makes sense to come up with a detailed um, uh, set of criteria. I think it's more of an an overall approach to um, to the economy. And to me, that approach, the most important one, is an economy that's open to surprises. That's mm-hmm. the most important thing. If you've got that, then lots of things follow. You need a um, rule of law because uh, government shouldn't be able to change the rules constantly uh, after the fact. Uh, if we should have safe property rights so that uh, if someone succeeds, it's uh, it's the fruit of their labor and they, they should get to keep it and not somebody else moving in and, and taking it. And you need an open economy both domestically and internationally so that you constantly pick up new ideas, good services, innovations from other places, other countries, but also from that odd innovator in the garage who came up with a with a strange idea. And if they're successful, they um, they should be allowed to success, even yeah. if it threatens <laughs> the incumbents. You shouldn't ban laboratory meat because it hurts the beef producers like, like Italy did, for uh, example. You have to be open to the fact that we just don't know where the next great ideas are going to come from. So we need to be open to them. Yes, it's a really, really interesting point that because you look at every time you kill an innovation, you're killing something else, which is the possibility that it will go out. And let's face it, bad ideas ultimately taken to market just end up as bankrupt. And therefore, it's a lot easier for the market to decide rather than letting government try to be the decider. Because when you look back in history, I mean, there are some real doozies out there, like the idea that you can take a piece of cardboard with your name on it into a restaurant and use that to sign the check wherever you go around the world, which was the original diners club. I mean, where on earth could that possibly end up? Oh, possibly the underpinning of the way we all travel so we don't have to take fortunes worth of currency, which we weren't allowed to do by the 1970s in Britain anyway. So so it, it becomes such a fascinating issue. I absolutely agree. And actually we've got a magnificent, I mean, actually the point about the rule of law, which is just flicked up on the screen is absolutely true. You do need a rule of law. And actually, I was discussing that just last week in the City of London with someone who is looking at high office in another South American country in the near future. And he said to me, what would you do? And he gave me a smorgasbord, for for want of a better globalized term. Um, The English language is incredible. It's got a word for everything. The the point he made was, what would you say? What's the one thing you've got to do? And he rolled off, you know, deregulating, making it easy. And I said, yeah, that's absolutely true. But actually, do you know what? You're a small South American state. Nobody, with the deepest of respect, trusts you. Throw out your legal system and bring in Anglo-Saxon common law for commercial transactions. Because then all the guys with the money have all got lawyers who understand Anglo-Saxon common law and they're going to trust you. And that might not work overnight, but it's such a way to manage to energize. I'm thinking back, actually, ladies and gentlemen, to Barnabas Reynolds, a fabulous earlier guest we had discussing this as well in Brexit. And and certainly that's something that's fascinating. Just to say, we have some great messages coming through. Colin Howard, good evening, Colin. Colin is one of the most innovative entrepreneurial gentlemen I have ever had the joy to meet. It was great to see you the other week, Colin. You're looking very well. Um, This guy deserves a bigger stage. I could not agree more. You deserve a much, much bigger stage than I IPO vid of of a Tuesday afternoon, but we're so excited that you can join us while we're here in the Caribbean and you're there um, in Sweden, in Europe. It's really, really marvelous to see you. Let me give you a break for just a second, because I want to go to another great entrepreneurial innovative mind and look at our finance book of the week. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, we run a series of a recommended book coming soon. It has to be said there is going to be a book by Johan Norberg in the future. I can see that's my great innovative ability. But this week's book was written by the father of financial futures, IPO vid guest number episode one, two, three, Richard Sander. It's electronic trading and blockchain yesterday, today and tomorrow with that absolutely marvelously 
fetching illustration of Doc Sander as one of the Brunels in the course of the, the 19th century. In 1980, he was an innovative. Actually, in 1970, ladies and gentlemen, Richard came forward with the world's first electronic exchange market, CCARP. He was at that point in time project director of the California Commodity Advisory Research Project. He went on to invent bond futures, financial futures, which took over the world and allowed us all a huge amount of risk transfer through many subsequent interest rate cycles and much, much more. He's the essentially father of the environmental markets the world over. Absolutely incredible. This book is a much read and I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it. And you should also check out Richard's IPO feed just a couple of weeks ago, which like today with Johan Norberg, the Capitalist Manifesto, was a true masterclass in free markets. So, Johan, when we're, we're looking at the way forward for different countries, do you think there is any reason for any, I mean, there are any economies that cannot manage to profit from essentially being a an ostensibly capitalist nation. I don't think there are any limits when it comes to um, what kind of like geographic location or resources or uh, background, because all those ideas have been disproven again and again. Uh, we used to think that only a few Protestant countries in Northern Europe could prosper. Definitely not Catholics, right? Uh, but then, obviously, the moment they began to uh, import some of those institutions of rule of law and free markets, they began to prosper. But people still said that, yeah, but not not in Asia. That's, that's impossible. Um, but then, you know, South Korea and apart from Japan, of course, South Korea and uh, Taiwan did it after the Second World War. And then if you look at the literature, lots of people said that, yes, they managed, but that's because they're so small on the periphery of world markets. <clears throat> then it's possible to enter global markets in, in a way. But, but apart from that, it, it's impossible. Then China and India picked up a few tricks and began to liberalize their economies uh, at least a, a bit and um, recorded record growth. And then people say, said, yeah, but that's because they're so big. <laughs> they have so much market power. There's so many. That's why it's not possible for small countries. And then we begin all over again. So the key issue is, is freedom. Uh, the key issue is allowing people to experiment and come up with new ideas and work hard to improve their lives and the lives of, of their loved ones. If you do that, then things happen. You know, I've, I've traveled around in desperately poor places and in, in uh, sub-Saharan African slums. And, you know, people aren't lazy. They work mm -hmm. tremendously hard and they have to to stay alive in a situation of unsecured property rights. They have to defend uh, their, their small territory and against uh, rules and regulations and corrupt people, as the saying goes in the slums of Kibera. It's not safe to carry cash around because there are too many policemen <laughs> around and they, they're going to steal your cash if they see it. So they work tremendously hard. What if they had the freedom to do it in a more productive way, then they would see the same kind, I think, of, of growth that we've so seen historically. So saying it's impossible is, is just a way of looking for excuses, I think. Yes, I mean, it's a great point. You look at Singapore, which is essentially an entirely uneconomic swampland with no natural water, was a hugely strategic resource for whoever controlled that, obviously controlled an incredible expanse of the Malacca Straits all around it. But nonetheless, they were never going to manage to make it in the world. And now they're effectively their GDP per head higher than Switzerland, which was quite an achievement after only 40, 50 years. One of the things also intrigues me there is you look at how the, the, the political narrative often changes. I mean, the Arab Spring, which took place, what, 10, 11 years ago, Nobody seems to remember that Mohammed Bouazizi, the man who ultimately self-immolated and kicked off the Arab Spring, he wasn't talking about political rights. It was very simply the fact that he could not freely sell his tomatoes at market without being effectively stolen from by the government, by the politicians, and particularly straight up front by the police who were doing all sorts of things and the fact they impounded his scales because he didn't have the right 
license under, I don't know, the, the, the Moroccan equivalent of ISO, goodness knows whatever, for tomato holding apparatus. When we look at it, I mean, it seems to me it's a very, very fundamental thing. If we allow people to trade, they will profit. Yeah, and that's an incredibly important point. You know, all these rules and regulations and license requirements and going to four different government agencies to be allowed <laughs> to have your cart and sell your fruit or vegetables, um, it's something that... Often big businesses, they just it's just part of the, the cost of operation and yeah. they have uh, departments dealing with it. But to a, a guy like Wazizi, uh, to the small scale businessman who wants to become big, to them, it's really a, a deal breaker. Then it, it ruins um, everything. And that's one reason why, why regulation is, is always at least very, very often, it's um, something that it's a subsidy of big businesses and yeah. of incumbents who, who know how to navigate all of that. But it's a way of ruining the opportunities for, for the have-nots. So what about these major international trading blocks and things like that? I mean, it strikes me, I have to say, I always thought the, the European Union is a huge uh, impediment to free markets, despite the fact that they talk about cross-border trade, but then ultimately they protect themselves from all sorts of other competition. Is there a way, do you think, that these organizations are going to see the light in the near future? Or maybe I've perceived them wrongly. If they see the light, it's more of an approaching train they're, they're seeing than, than the end of the tunnel. Because I think that what we're going through right now is we're in a bad place, um, partly because of this fear of the world, because of the pandemic, because of geopolitical tensions. There is this sense everywhere, not the least in the European Union, that to be strong, we have to repatriate production. We have to make sure that we get all the, the important stuff back home to Europe. Uh, so probably more subsidies, more tariffs are, are coming in the near future. Uh, and to me, this is all based on a terrible, terrible misunderstanding. There's a reason why the traditional saying doesn't go, put all your eggs in one basket and protect it with tariffs and regulations. Because <laughs> if you, you know, most problems, most disasters are local and regional by nature. It's a drought, it's an extreme weather event, it's war, it's a cyber attack, it's whatever. Then it's incredibly important to be able to, to use trade links and supply chains to improvise and to adapt. If you have all your production back home, then if trouble hits there, it's game over. This is what, you know... What America recently discovered with the baby infant formula, they yes. had been very successful in repatriating all the production because they had all these tariffs, they had regulations, so no European infant baby formula was allowed to be sold there. Then that felt safe, right? They had it all close by. But then all it took was problems in one factory in the fall of 2020 or something like that to, to create a national shortage. Young expectant mothers were sort of taking the car across the borders to Mexico to, yeah. to buy the stuff. Um, so it's a terrible misreading uh, of, of what creates resilience and, and security. But I think one reason why they do it is that there's always a large supply of lobbyists who yeah. will tell you that, look, our production is an essential good and to stay here, we it would be nice with some being able to put our hands in in the pockets of the taxpayers. So they they will have an an, an audience. Yes, when you talk about lobbyists, I'm always reminded of, of course, I mean, the, the Chavistas in Venezuela, they always used to have this empty seat at the table, didn't Chavez, for uh, at every dinner and every meeting for Simon Bolivar to sit in the corner. I've always thought it would be a great idea if the likes of the European Union or the US or other major trade organizations or wherever had a meeting where they have all the lobbyists in one room and then they have an empty chair to remind us of the power of innovation and the people who are not represented 
represented in the room because actually they're the future. You guys that are sitting around the outside probably aren't in the same way, shape or, shape or form. Um, we've got a fantastic question come in from Marianne Madeira. Hello, Marianne. Thank you so much for asking. Hi, Johan. What is the best way for an emerging market to get ahead in the modern age? Yeah, I think this is a great question and partly relates to Patrick's um, discussion about legal systems and the rule of law. Uh, you need to establish some credibility, some reputation, and uh, perhaps you can do it by importing some um, legal credibility in, in British common law, Anglo-Saxon common law, or if you have a problem with your central bank, dollarizing and, and importing the tarnished reputation uh, of the US <laughs> central bank, but yet better than the Argentinian one. So uh, at at least establishing this kind of rule of law and making sure that we're not there to try to pick winners and pick losers and decide who gets what. We will create a set of institutions and then let the players play. Um, but when it comes to policy reform, another thing that I think is incredibly important and underrated is to expose your market for harsh, brutal competition. And that always feels uncomfortable because it threatens your businesses and the, the things that you're trying to create. But this is exactly in the incentives that we need to keep on upgrading technology and management and making sure that you get that rush of productivity that will make it possible to compete on the world stage. So any opportunity to allow this um, unpopular, harsh competition and, and imports of goods, technologies, and ideas is, is very important, I think. Fabulous answer. Thank you very, very much, Marianne, for the question. Thank you, Johan Norberg, author of The Capitalist Manifesto. So here we are. We've got barely 10 minutes left in the show. And I suppose I have to ask you one, one question, which is, if we're looking at your book, The Capitalist Manifesto, is there a particular key takeaway that you think applies to everybody, whether they're an entrepreneur, an investor, a government official, or wherever their, their place in life in the emerging markets or in the established ones? Well, the one key lesson, I think, if there is one that applies to everyone, is that don't think you can control events and don't overrate your plans whether you're in government or uh, a, an investor or a business or a household, uh, because you can't, because there are billions of, of moving parts uh, constantly. And it's it's dangerous to, to overrate it because then you miss those opportunities for surprises. That's what happens when governments try to set plans and, um, and, and try to regulate everything accordingly. They're going to miss out on the experiments that that would have been important. But it's also when I look at successful business models and talk to successful entrepreneurs, no one had it from the beginning. Nobody really knew what their business model was going to look like. It was as a, I do, as you mentioned, some uh, uh, documentary films. And one producer told me that his key lesson for starting a project is we need a plan so that we have something to divert from so that we can, uh, because we need an idea, a plan and, uh, or an ambition to get out of the cave and do something. But when we're there, we, we're going to have to start looking for better opportunities than what we planned for at the back there in the ivory tower. And so I think that being open to trial and error, competition, uh, pushback from investors, from markets, from consumers, and then adapting and experimenting again. In the end, that's how everything good comes into the world. Yes, indeed. As Eisenhower, I think, famously said, plans are nothing, but planning is everything, uh, popularized by Mike Tyson, which was, I've never seen a plan that could manage to survive a smack in the mouth, which certainly if it came from Mike Tyson, I think would be quite difficult to dispute. So look, we are almost at the end of our allotted time, unfortunately, Johan. Therefore, I'm just going to ask you that question we ask every guest. Johan Norberg, author of The Capitalist Manifesto, where do you think the capital market revolution goes next? It has to be Africa. 
if what I said is true, that it's not about geographical location or state of um, uh, of the place, but it's possible everywhere. This is a pl the place that will grow in population when the rest of us shrinks. It'll create more population density, which will be important in Africa to create investments and opportunities and better transport links and come up with new ideas and innovations and um, and businesses. So, and and it's underrated, <laughs> tremendously underrated. And some places will mess up big time, tremendously, and some states will continue to collapse and, and fail. But I do think that some will use these opportunities to create some of the next growth wonders. So we're going to have to keep at least an eye on what goes on there. What a fascinating insight, Johan Norberg. I'm, I'm reminded actually of being on CNBC 20-ish years ago, and they said, what did I think was going to happen that would be really significant? And I said, watch for the growth of China and the rise of China. And they all laughed at me and essentially poured scorn on the whole concept. And I think actually you saying that it's Africa probably will draw scorn from a lot of people because that's not what they're looking. And as we know, that's a huge opportunity for markets at all points in time. Ladies and gentlemen, that is going to conclude today's show, although we could quite happily carry on, I think, for another couple of years chatting to Johan, but we've had, well, in his own words, a magnificent rush of productivity as we look at the Capitalist Manifesto and how that's impacted on things throughout the world. Thank you very, very much to our commenters and questioners today, Peter Second, Jonathan Cowan, Ian Miller, Colin Howard, and Marianne Madeira. I want to thank our production team hugely, Herminia, Mary, and Natalie. I'm sorry we were having a few problems with the LinkedIn feed earlier on, but I Hopefully that has been cured. All out of our control, but nonetheless, isn't technology wonderful, ladies and gentlemen? Try doing this live stream in 1982. So it has to be Africa, ladies and gentlemen. That's one of the options. I think the point is it has to be capitalism. Thank you very, very much, Johan Norberg. My name is Patrick L. Young. We'll be back next week for another show at the same time, same place, slightly earlier. That's going to be midday in US time at six o'clock London time. My name is Patrick L. Young. The publisher of Exchange Invest saying, have a great evening, have a great week in life and markets. And thanks again to the Kazakhstan Stock Exchange. Going to see Almaty was an incredible experience. Have a great week, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. Thank you.